take time tonight. We want to talk a little bit more of where we began on pressing into the kingdom. We began on Sunday, and we probably want to spend one more message on this at least, and really to be able to hear from the Spirit of the Lord. Why don't we open up here to Amos chapter 6, Amos chapter 6, and let's see what the Lord would speak to us. And Amos chapter 6, and so thankful as we break this bread of God together, believe in the Lord, we'll make it as that angel's food that the prophet Elijah in his discouragement ate and went in the strength of it, praise God, for 40 days and 40 nights. And would to God that this would be as angel's food to us tonight, food from heaven, bread for the soul, that we can run in the strength of it. Chapter 6, verse 1, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. And he says, as we look at this, and, 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 and you go down in this passage, the, the reproof of the Lord that, that came to these people that found themselves just dwelling at ease in verse 4, that lie upon their beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs of the flock and the calves in the midst of the salt stall. Father, we ask that you would speak to us tonight through this word. Stir us, O oh God. Let this word pierce our hearts, Lord, and make it to be a fire shut up in our bones. Stir up the gift of God. Revive the fire, Lord. Re revive our hearts in a day that the love of many is growing cold, Lord. Father, we believe that your Holy Spirit will quicken it, reveal it, and change us from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Do you believe that? Say amen. Amen. Woe be to those that dwell at ease in Zion. And one of the things we were talking about in this hour is the need for us to stay stirred up in our God. You know, a casual glance of the, the scores of parables of the Lord Jesus, how many of them dealt with being found to be faithful stewards so that when the master returns that we would be found not drunken in the night, not sleeping or slumbering, not as the five foolish virgins whose lamps were empty and, uh, uh, and, and were found unprepared. So what we're talking about tonight is, is truly that, that, that spirit that will press into the kingdom beyond all of the temptations of apathy and slumber and the ease that many are dwelling in. You know, we're, we're in an hour now that there's many that have projected many will never go back to the church. I mean, to a physical gathering that literally will just ha have adopted this concept that we can just look online and get a teaching online or some kind of interactive uh, type of program through the Internet. And, and yet the Bible says clearly that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And that was speaking of literally, physically, visibly. And even though they didn't have internet back then, there are many that could have justified themselves saying, well, we're together in spirit. But he was saying, no, we've got to continue to come together. And, and of course, we know that what happens in those times, Hebrews 10 and 24, we, we provoke one another to love and good works. We're not here just for our, for our own edification. In fact, it should be first and foremost for the glory of God, and because it is for him, it's the laying down of our lives one for another, considering one another to provoke, to incite the passions, to stir up that flame, to light the fire. 
that passion for God. As we stir up the gift of God within us that we wouldn't fall asleep and and be found sleeping in the night. Awake, thou that sleepest, and Christ will give you light. Awake to righteousness and sin not, Paul would preach to the churches. Awake to righteousness. And just that need for remaining awake, alert, and not to be found slumbering in the night. And and he talked about those that were dwelling at ease. This is no time to take our ease. We know how many will not be found faithful because they'll just eat, drink, and be merry attitude. So important to stay sharp. The Bible says we're not to be drunk with wine wherein is excess, to be, but to be filled with the Spirit. And that talks about to be constantly be being filled. Hallelujah. If you've not received that baptism of fire, would to God that you would cry out until those tongues are bursting forth from your innermost being and that refreshing that comes through those tongues of fire. This is the refreshing wherewith he will cause the weary to rest. Isaiah 28 prophesied, out of your innermost being, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, and this spoke he of the Holy Ghost. It's a time for our lamps to be full. Remember, those were five virgins. Virginity, it's referring to purity, innocence. In Matthew 25, there was five wise and five foolish, but they were all virgins. They were all chosen to be part of that wedding ceremony, but five were ready and five, their lamps were empty. When that midnight cry came, they thought they'd be able to live off of or to be able to get the other's oil, but they said, no, we can't give you. This is sufficient for us. It would be shame for us. you got to get your own oil. And when they were out trying to get the oil, the bridegroom called, and they missed the wedding feast. And I believe there's going to be many that are going to be found just unprepared when that trumpet of God sounds. The Bible says he's going to appear that second time without sin unto salvation, Hebrews 9, 28, to those that are looking for him. Are you looking for him tonight? Are you really looking up? Do do we understand that the time is at hand and and we've got to be redeeming the time? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone called looking for... uh, uh, Mohammed, uh, I guess it was a former person who owned my phone number. I said, no, only Jesus is here. Hallelujah. And let me tell you what he can do for you. Every opportunity to boldly preach in his name, to preach the word, instant, in season, and out of season, knowing that the time is short, the day of God is at hand. And so it's no time to be at ease and And we know that that's going to happen to many, that their love will grow cold. And we've seen in in Revelation 2 and verse 4 that though this was a people that had many good works and many good deeds, and yet he says, I have somewhat against you that you've you've left that first love. And, And we don't want to lose that first love, that love for his presence, that love for his word, that love for his house, that love for his people, that love for the lost, that love to be holy even as he is holy. Can somebody say amen? we got to stir ourselves up. we got to let that Holy Ghost cry out for the Holy Ghost to breathe on these bones when they become dry and dead and make these bones to live again. And when we see this, we can begin to understand it's no time to be lying on our couches. 2 Samuel chapter 12, when we've seen there, when David was doing that and how he fell into the sin of adultery and murder and lying and covering. But it says when the time that kings ought to be at war, he was just relaxing. And the enemy comes and he, and, he, and, he, and he comes to try to find us unaware. 
He comes when, a, when we're not watching, when we're not being sober, as 1 Peter 5 says, to, when we're not staying humble under the mighty hand of God, that sense of dependency and neediness of God. That lying low, God, uh, we need you. I can't make it without you. It's, it's only your strength and my weakness that I'll overcome. Because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion and he's roaming about seeking whom he may devour, whom we must resist steadfast in the faith. We're living in an age that the catering to the flesh, the love of pleasure, has never been greater in a nation on the face of the earth. At our fingertips, lust or or whatever you desire, hit a few buttons, punch a few numbers off a plastic card, and it's at your doorstep the next day. A few fingers to indulge your eyes and whatever you want to look at, from things to lust to whatever it is. And we're in a day of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. My concern is in this hour that we would stay stirred up when I see the adversities come and, and us begin to cave in and yield and give in or give up or to get distracted, saints of God, we can all get distracted. We can all cave into temptation. We can all momentarily just, just give in to that flesh or lust or pride or, or that besetting sin. But dear God, we've got to get up and repent, praise God, and run back to Him and be crying out to Him to stay stirred up in our God. Amen? Just man that falls seven times, but he rises up again. There's a proverb that says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. We quoted from Jeremiah 12, if, if, if the footmen have wearied you, what are you going to do when the horsemen come? And, and if in the land of peace you're being overwhelmed, what are you going to do in the floods of the Jordan? And so God is using the trials in our lives right now to prepare us for greater that are ahead. And if we don't embrace the cup of sufferings in what we're going through today, you won't be able to stand tomorrow. So we can't be sitting at home in our little comfort zones and the moment a little obstacle and we, we cloak ourselves with an excuse and a reason why we can't serve God, why we can't be in the house of God to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, why we can't be on our knees calling on God, why we can't be searching the scriptures and crying out to the Lord. If you, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is little, it's small. I don't know about you, that provokes me. That beautiful proverb that says, when he went by the field of the slothful and he, and he beheld and he got wisdom because he looked and this was the field of, of that irresponsible sluggard. And, and we're not talking about just natural diligence, but he says their wall was broken down and, and nettles and thistles and weeds had, had grown up on that field and, 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 and there was no fruit in it and it, and it was just a, a disaster. And he says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms, and so shall your poverty come on you as, a, as, a, as an armed man, as a traveling bandit, as a thief. It'll steal your faith. It'll steal the presence of God. It'll steal that fervent love for the people of God, that hunger, that thirst for his word. Now we're looking to the flesh. Now we're looking to the lust. Now we're looking at TV. Now we're looking to be entertained and trying to find something to satisfy the emptiness of our hearts. And it's all a lie. It can't satisfy when you find yourself in that place of being attracted again by the world or trying to find something in the world to, 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 that's drawing your lust or drawing you to indulge in, it's a sign of discontentment. And that contentment comes from the presence of the Lord. 
Contentment literally means sufficient. It's enough. And when you get into his presence and he fills your empty cup, he fills my cup, we'll be able to say glory to God. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. The young lions lack and they roar and, you know, for hunger, but he says there is no lack to those that fear him. Hallelujah. And so that satisfaction that comes from the presence of the Lord, nothing in this world can satisfy the soul. It can distract you for a moment. It can set you at ease in your soul for a moment, but it can't satisfy, it can't feed that inner hunger and that that soul, the, the spirit man that was created by God and for God. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. And so we then seen that we it's no time for ease, but in fact we we seen here in Luke 16 that when he was speaking to people that were covetous and and he they were hearing the things he was teaching on and of being faithful in the things that were committed and can I remind us when we talk about that stewardship and that field of the slothful is You can be very diligent in the flesh, but very slothful in spirit. Sometimes, in fact, we can be so busy with the things of the world, taking care of all of our natural responsibilities, but be very negligent to our spiritual well-being, to the spiritual well-being of our homes, the spiritual well-being of our prayer life, of our study of the Word, of our witness, of, of... of our brothers and sisters in the house of the Lord. So don't be deceived. Natural diligence doesn't equal spiritual diligence. Now when you are spiritually diligent, the Bible says we'll be careful to maintain good works. Don't talk to me how much in the spirit you are when you're being very lazy in the flesh. Because if you're spiritually diligent, then God will make you to be diligent in those responsibilities he requires of us in the word, as parents, as wives, as husbands, as brothers in the Lord, to be there as our brother's sister's keeper. You know, in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 1, Paul said, we're stewards of the mysteries of God. A steward was someone who was entrusted with his master's goods or to the owner of an estate. And it was required if you would ever be a steward, someone that was entrusted with those things, you must be found faithful. God's looking for faithful men in this hour. Many men will claim unfailing love. Proverbs 27 and verse 1 says, I like the NIV, but it says, a faithful man who can find. Many men will claim that unfailing, oh, I'm with you, pastor, I'm with you, my brother, but... Better is a friend who's near than a brother who's far off. Amen? That's what the proverb says. And so we're not looking to be following a far off. We're we're looking to be faithful stewards. And if God is going to entrust us with his power, with his manifest presence, with signs and wonders, with those words from heaven, with the glory of God, with the fruits of the Spirit and the, and the ministry gifts of the Spirit is required of a steward that a man be found faithful. Faithful in the Greek language, it means someone who's reliable, someone who's trusty, is trusty or trustworthy, someone who can be dependent on, someone who's constant, someone who's consistent, someone who is of... It uses that phrase in many lexicons, fidelity, like faithfulness to a vow, faithfulness to a marriage, faithfulness to a covenant, faithfulness to a responsibility, something you have vouched to do. The Bible says in Psalm 101 that my eyes are, his eyes are on the faithful of the land. Hallelujah. If you want to get the eye of God upon you, just purpose in your heart, I'm going to be faithful to God. 
by his strength, by the power of his Holy Ghost, his Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost and power, I am going to be that one who can be relied upon, that's dependable, that's constant, that's consistent, hallelujah, that's someone that holds to their word. And his eyes are on the faithful of the land. The scripture says, I believe it's Proverbs 20, 28, that the faithful man will abound with blessings. God is not mocked, the scripture says. Galatians 6, verses 8 and 9. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen? Don't be weary, trust in God. Don't be weary, believe in God for that miracle in your life. Don't be weary of, of saying, God's where, where is the blessing? We just got done uh, studying that, that, you know, his, that his praise, we will pre- bless and praise the Lord at all times. His mouth, his praise shall be continually in our mouth. And no matter what it looks like, we walk by faith and not by sight. We call those things that are not as though they were. Are you doing that in your life? Are you calling the things that are not as though they were? Hallelujah. And there's no temptation but what's common to man, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. But with every temptation, God is making a way of escape so that we can endure it. So let's not make excuses. Let's not justify what we ought to be doing that we're not. But let's just cry out to God. God, I want to be found faithful. I want to be that good and faithful servant that when you come, you'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my kingdom and was rewarded greatly. And so God's looking for that faithful man. And so as we see this then, we can't allow ourselves to grow weary in the well-doing. The the adversities are going to be much. We've seen in Acts 14 and 22 that it's through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom of God. It's through much tribulation. And then we were seeing here in Luke 16 that when these Pharisees were covetous, they were deriding him and And he said, you're those in Luke 16 and verse 15 that justifies yourself before men, but God knows your hearts for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So often we'll find the thing that men could praise of how successful we are or how outwardly rich or blessed we are or some natural giftings or possessions that that, that we may have, and yet Jesus said a man's life doesn't consist of the abundance of the things that he possesses. What does it profit a man if we gain the whole world and lose our own souls? And so he was speaking to these that were covetous, and, and, and he said the law and the prophets were on the John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man, what? presses into the kingdom, hallelujah. And so the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Are you pressing in? Now, every one of us is being tested in different ways. Sometimes we found it a common thing for when you're in the heat of battle to feel like no one's going through what you're going through. No one truly understands. No one knows. God always knows. Hallelujah. And let me tell you, there's not a soul in this earth, a saint of God, that's not passing through fire and their faith is being stretched to the utmost just like yours is being stretched. You may look and think their lives are uneventful. They don't know anything about what I'm going through. But you don't know anything about the demons that they're battling with in the night season. And you need to pray for them just as you pray for your own self when you're in that desperate condition. We should be touched with the feelings of one another's infirmities. We put out all of those prayer requests today. That's a lot of things to pray for. And how many more could we have added? We could have added every one of us in this room. 
Sometimes I write and write till there's just no more space on that thing. You just got to send it, you know. It just runs out of spaces, you know. But we should be moved by those needs, moved by those that are battling and suffering and, and those that are struggling, that we stand in the gap. And you may be on your job. You, you, you may be in your bed at night, and you just, just raise that hand, lift your voice, whisper those prayers, glory to God. Three words and faith can move a mountain because if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, it can cause the mountains to be cast into the sea. Oh, glory to God. Just being on our knees in prayer here on Tuesday nights. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. We are often so few, but I know power is coming from heaven. And I know if I've got Mama and Sister Annie and the deacons at my side and a few others, glory to God. Power is moving from the throne of God. And as we're coming into this hour, we, we, we understand that we're going to have to press in. And when we talk about pressing in, it comes from that wor root word, biazzo, which is that, that zealous, determined perseverance. You know, Jesus said, it's he that endures to the end that will be saved. It's he that shall endure to the end. That's the one who's going to be saved. Many begin well, but if the righteous man turns from his righteousness and then he dies in his sins, and even when he was warned doesn't turn from his sins, he will die in his sins and his blood will be on his own head. And all the righteousness which he's committed will be remembered no more, Ezekiel 18 said. So it puts a holy fear. We studied recently of the, uh, of the proverb that, that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge or, you know, just the numbness or whatever comes about from, you know, eating sour grapes and whether it was the, the flesh and the carnality of their fathers that were just driven to eat something that wasn't ready or wholesome and, and, and yet they were blaming their sins and the, the judgments that were falling on them on the sins of their fathers and the prophet was saying, no, it's the soul that sins that'll die. We can't point the finger. We got we to gotta own up to our own faults and failures and dig into God and cry out to God for strength and power and, and not be blaming it on the, on the things that we may have passed through or inflicted upon us or, 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 or wrongs that we suffered. And so we, we seen that there's going to have to be perseverance if we're going to enter in. We were talking about the fact that Jesus said in Luke chapter 13 and verse 24 when the disciples were, were asking him, Lord, are there, are there few that be saved? And he said, said, strive to enter in at the narrow gate. For many will, will think to enter in, and we've seen that literally what that's referring to, think to enter in, as the one Greek scholar put it, by another way. There is no other way. It's a straight gate and a narrow path. It's a road of carrying a cross. It's a road of death to self, but it's life and life evermore. How many here you found and proven over and over again when you give into the flesh at the end of the day, you don't sleep so well? Anyone know what I'm talking about? And you might have gave your flesh what it wanted. No major catastrophe happened. The fire didn't fall from heaven or a lightning bolt uh, in your backside. But, but you, there's no rest because you know this is not acceptable to God. But my God, when you choose to deny yourself take up your cross to mortify the deeds of the body by the power of the Spirit. Oh, the joy that floods your soul. Amen. Hallelujah. Everything can be falling in around you. Things may not look good, but there is no, there is no greater joy than, than what Paul said. This is, this is our boast, the testimony of our conscience, that in godly simplicity and sincerity, said in 2 Corinthians 1, we have had our conversation in the world. Hallelujah. A holy living. Man, when your conscience is clear, saints, and I'm not talking about sinless. When you sin, repent. 
Ask, cry out to God, turn from it, hate it. Ask God to help you and leave it behind. Amen? Leave it behind, glory to God. It's under the blood of Jesus. Not for us to continue in sin, but to continue to pursue God and allow him to work in us both to will and do his good pleasure. So we got to strive to enter in at the narrow gate. Part of that narrow gate means... Uh, as one one of the scholars was saying, it, it, it's it's like we're being squeezed. It, it's not a lot of wiggle room for the flesh. How many of you find that you know your flesh is always trying to wiggle its way out? You know, <laughs> and if you just give it a little room, it'll wiggle its way out, man. I mean, it's got to be kept under lock and key. The Apostle Paul said, and we'll put it on the screen in 1 Corinthians 9, that every man that strives for the mastery or that victor's crown, that word strives is the same Greek word, everyone that presses in, everyone that's striving to enter in at the narrow gate. He, he, he speaks of, uh, in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 9, verse uh, 24, I believe it is, and, and we'll see here that as he speaks there and he's, and he's bringing that word that he's stirring the people up from his own testimony, he says, know ye not that they which run in a race, and, you know, they were very familiar with the Olympic Games, and those games were so much part of that Roman Grecian culture, and they were very, very much given to sports and the stadiums and great athletic events, and You've heard it many times, but there are some ancient writings that recorded in the day that in those games there was men that could have an eye ripped out or, or a limb just uh, ripped from them, and, and some would even die in those games. And it was, it was, uh, it was very you know, competitive. It was a, a fierce struggle. Because when we talk about this word to strive, we've seen in the Greek language, it's that Greek word agonazomai, which comes from agon, which is our English word for stadium. And it was talking about a place of an intense emotion, physical struggle. Some of you have seen, you know, maybe some of those sports events where the people are almost mad and crazy. I always remember the old games of... Uh, the Washington Redskins, when they used to play in that RFK stadium and, and the cameras would shake when, when it was being nationally televised because the whole stadium was literally shaking. It would be so intense. And it's a place of an intense emotional, physical, psychological battle. It's a contest. It's speaking of great competition. Can I remind us Satan is competing for your soul? Can I remind you that as Jesus said to Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I'm praying for you. I prayed for you. And Satan is trying to shake us up. He's trying to sift us. He's trying to distract you. He's trying to entangle you. He's trying to, 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 to get you just caught up where you lose that, that intimacy, that life of God. You know, when you lose your intimacy with God, that's when you can sin. You're not as sensitive to his presence. That's when the fear of God begins to leave us. But when your heart is, is, is in, the, when you're in the spirit, you're aware of God's presence. There's a, a greater reverence and fear. And, and it's kind of like uh, Joseph when, when Potiphar's wife was badgering him, trying to seduce him. And he was a faithful young man. And and, and she was constantly after him, but finally when she grabbed him and, and trying to seduce him, he fled, and his words were, how can I do this and sin against my God and against my master? When you're walking in the, in the spirit, when, you're, when, when, you're, when that word is alive in you and you're abiding in him, it's not as easy. You can't just overlook his presence. There's a greater sensitivity. How sensitive to the Holy Spirit are you tonight? And it's so important, especially in those areas of besetting sins, one, to be quite frank, your conscience is dull. 
Your conscience is not so. You have committed that sin so many times that your conscience is not easily pricked. And, and that's why we need the totality of just being in his presence where the, the, the awareness of his lordship and his holiness and, and just all that he's done for us and all that he has for us that will make the things of the world look like rubbish. That you can say like Paul, yea, doubtless, I count all things but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. They're just dung compared to knowing him. Can somebody say amen? But we know when we get in the flesh, then the carnal mind ascends again. And then we have nothing more than the testimony of Paul. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin, this body of death? And so is this this striving. We're talking about the root word for a stadium, an agon, a, a stadium. And it was that place where there was, it literally means to strive, as he's saying here. Know ye not they which run in a race... Uh, run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may attain. When we, when we're looking here and 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 crying out to God to, to speak to us, and verse twenty five for every one, every man that strives for the mastery. Are you striving for that victor's crown, saints? We're going to leave it all behind. You know, you've taken nothing, you've brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can take nothing out. All that you work for in this world, it's all going to be left behind. You know, it it strikes me when you see people that leave this world and, and now all their things are just scattered and even sometimes they'll just give it away or it's in a state market and things they worked and labored are now just like rubbish to other things. Things that were, were, were treasures to them are just left behind and scattered and often just loaded up and sent to the dump. I would to God that we could be stirred. I always laugh and just in a joy in the Holy Ghost and just remember some of those testimonies in my own life of those things that were once treasures just being cast away. I got the picture when I was in Baltimore and I can just remember one time where I was emptying stuff out of my storage and watching that speaker that I could listen to music for for sometimes 14 hours just flying in the air. It was like it went in slow motion for a moment. And kaboom into the dumpster. Don't want it. Count it dung. I don't want that in my life. I'm free. And I count it all dung. And, and as I watched, it was like the Holy Ghost all of a sudden visited me and, and opened my eyes to see what used to be my treasures is now dung. And now I have new treasures. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so when you strive for that mastery, it's speaking then of that victor's crown. It's a place to, it speaks of to struggle, to fight, to engage in an intense confidence, a contents, a, a, a fierce emotional, physical, psychological, and in our case, spiritual struggle. One of the greatest examples of, of how to define this word to strive was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying and the weight of the powers of darkness. You can see a few verses when you put all the Gospels together, but I believe it's in Matthew where it says his soul was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Do you know what that was saying? He was saying he was almost being crushed to death by the weight that was resting upon him of what he's about to face. And we have no idea what it was to take the judgment of the world. We haven't even experienced the judgment of the Lord for our sins because we were forgiven before we were ever judged. Jesus took that judgment, took that punishment, took the guilt 
not just for as it would be for ourselves, but for the whole world resting upon his shoulders. And, and, and the scripture tells us there when he was in the garden and he's praying and his disciples are, are sleeping and, and he tells them to, to watch and pray so you don't enter into temptation. And, and, and in verse 43 of Luke 22, he says, an angel appeared from heaven strengthening them. Let me tell you, when you choose to obey God in the trial, God will send his angels to strengthen you. Hallelujah. I tell you by God, Laron, the angels of God are strengthening you tonight. The angels of God are strengthening you in your battles and in your wars. The angels of God are visiting. They're being sent forth from the throne of God. They're the angels of God that are sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. Hallelujah. When you're obeying God in the fire, in the trial, in your Gethsemane, and as he was in that Gethsemane experience and verse 44 and being in what? Agony. Being in agony, he prayed what? The more earnestly. Being in agony, he prayed the more earnestly. We're talking about saints pressing into the kingdom tonight. When the adversity's there, do we quickly succumb? Do we quickly run when it's an, something that's required of a sacrifice of us and uh, to, to, to surrender something or to give up something or to have to die to self to do what our flesh doesn't feel like doing? Are we choosing the narrow path? Yes, it's straight. Yes, it's narrow. But it's the way of eternal life. Hallelujah. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and 15 that straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. But wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go that path. So few are willing to give up the momentary comforts and they'll sacrifice eternity. Sat here in the cold and the wind today just just pleading with this man's soul on the sidewalk, and his, his heart was so hard. And no matter what I shared with him of his soul and eternity and the blood of Jesus and the love of God, and, and he started to listen a little bit, and he says, do you think the soup kitchen is open over there? I said, it probably is. He says, thank you very much, I'm going. Soul trembled. No ears to hear. No heart to be convicted or pierced, hardened, and more concerned about a meal for the belly than his eternal soul. My God, help us in this hour. And we see that Jesus was in agony, and, and in agony he prayed the more earnestly. He pressed in, hallelujah. And he was pressing in, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose up from prayer, he was come to his disciples and he found them sleeping, not just sleeping, but sleeping for what? For sorrow. And you know, you can bask your flesh with whatever it is just because you're stressed out and let me just, you know, get me a gallon of ice cream and turn on the TV and six movies or whatever fleshes you out, whatever it is, just to some way to just sleep away our sorrows, the stress, the anxiety. There is no rest outside of his presence. There is no peace to the wicked. He is our peace. Ephesians says. And so we need to understand that that is the only place of rest and refreshing and peace. And though the flesh wants its indulgences and wants its rewards and, and wants to be basked and lavish, and, and yet it just leaves us, the eye is never satisfied with seeing. The ear is never satisfied with hearing. The, he that loves silver will never be satisfied with silver. Whatever it is, you, it's all vanity and vexation of the Spirit. Haven't we proven it over and again? 
And so when we talk about pressing in, look at the example of Jesus. The Bible tells us in, 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 in Hebrews chapter 12, when he spoke of all of those great cloud of witnesses, we can look at it, those that were, they, that were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they, were, they, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and tormented, wandering in dens and rocks and caves of the earth. Imagine, of whom the world was not even worthy of them. The price they paid to stay faithful, to remain obedient. And we've seen that these all obtained a good report. And then he goes right into, uh, into chapter 12 and verse 1 where, where he says, Wherefore, seeing we're encompassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, all of these people who shed their blood and were sawn asunder and, and, and wandered in the earth and were tortured and tormented and persecuted, it's like they're standing in the stadium cheering us on. They're in the stands right now. I believe somehow in heaven they're all part of that universal, just Jesus who's ever living to make intercession. I believe the saints of God are praying for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And as we're, as we're there, and, and, and it's like a great cloud of witnesses and that we're surrounded by, and, and he says, seeing that we're encompassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every sin and weight that, that so easily besets us. Oh, saints, we all got it. We, we all got those small foxes that want to steal the vine and steal the joy of the Lord, steal your peace, uh, get you back in the flesh, get you back in that besetting sin. And he says, chuck those things, throw them, fling them away, throw them off of you. Lay aside every sin and weight that does so easily beset and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Endurance. Let us press in is what he's saying. Let us press in. He says laying aside every sin and weight that, that tries to beset us. And it's not just the sins, but it's just the weights of the world. Oh my God, Jesus said it's easier for the camel to for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man or those that trust in the riches to enter into the kingdom. But sometimes I, I picture, and we know the story, sometimes they'd have a, a narrow opening in the city that they could keep the gates closed from intruders and armies by night. But, but sometimes travelers coming in the middle of the night, they'd have to put their camels down and unlaid everything so there was, or their beasts of burden, there was just sufficient room to get in. And I wonder how many saints were, were trying to carry all the world's baggage and still fit through this narrow gate. It won't work, saints. You've got to lay aside not only the sin, but the weights. What's slowing you down in your life? Think about it. Pray about it. What's slowing you down in your pursuit? What's slowing you down? Let's believe God to fling it off. Amen to throw it aside, the sins and weights which do so easily uh, beset us. We're very easily given if we don't take heed. And let us run with what? Patience, praise God. Endurance, steadfastness, perseverance. We've got to press into the kingdom of God. And look at the next verse. He says, looking unto who? Jesus. And being in agony, he prayed the more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Hallelujah. And they were sleeping for sorrow, but Jesus was praying. Jesus was interceding. Jesus was obeying. We look down at what's going on, and he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and what? Oh, hallelujah, saints. Can I remind you, he's the finisher of your faith. He will, as the psalm says, perfect that which concerns you. Philippians 1 and verse 6, He that has begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. 
I don't care what the enemy's saying. I don't care what your own mind thinks. I don't care what your unsaved family thinks or says about you. I don't care what the world's liars say about you. He that has begun a good work in you will finish it. You have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Hallelujah. All we got to do is just keep surrendering and staying yielded. It's all you got to do, hallelujah. Just hang on to the hem of his garment, glory to God. And as we see this, he, he, we go back to Hebrews 12, we, we understand then in this battle and in this fight that we've got to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, the joy. Saints, are you looking at the goal? Are you looking at the goal? We're almost there. We're almost home. Hallelujah. Look at the person next to you and say, we're almost there. We're almost home. We're almost there. If you could just see the finish line, saints, a a day with the Lord is a a thousand years and a thousand of your years is like a day. We're, We're so close. Our lives as a vapor will soon be gone. You know, as I was sitting in comfort in Laron, you, you, you may not know, his brother was shot in the face many times. He was just flat out murdered. You know, you look at that, and you, how do you reg- put your brother? How do you go through that? But I can tell you by God, and I can say it, even at the sound of my voice and in Deacon Laron's ears, because we know our God is just. Our God is good. Our God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And the sufferings of this present time can't even be compared with the glory which will be revealed. He's the judge of the earth. He does right. We don't need to take vengeance. Vengeance is the Lord. He'll repay. But we cry out, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mer- forgive them for they know not what they do. Lay not to sin that are charged. God, save them before they're damned in hell forever. We look at this hour and and what we're going through, and we're going to be going through brutal trials and and, and temptations, but for the joy, for the goal, Paul said in Philippians 3, that I haven't apprehended as I ought to in verse 13. But this one thing I have, we were quoting, forgetting the things which are what? Behind. Forgetting the things which are behind. God's forgotten. God's forgiven. Why don't we? Your sins and iniquities, I will what? Remember no more. As far as east is from the, he removes our transgressions from us. He casts them over his shoulder. He casts them into the sea, the scripture says. And so we got to forget our failures, forget the things that even were inflicted on you. And he says, I'm forgetting the things that you're behind and, and reaching forth to the things that you're before that I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Saints, there's such a reward that awaits us. Oh, my we're there. As I, as I walked around this building at midnight and I looked around there and I thought, my God, you can, there's nothing too hard for you. This can seem like nothing to the financial moguls in the world. But it was done by faith, hallelujah. It was done by believing God. It was done by the sacrifices of his people. It was done by supernatural intervention and and multiplication of our resource. It was done by his wisdom and discernment and, 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 and his prudence working in us. Who can tell what God will do? I looked at the land next. I said, who knows? Maybe that'll be a five-story building that'll be built there. And, and not only a, a, a maybe this will just be like the closet over here or just a small part of the school. Who knows what God can do? Hallelujah. And as we were looking at this and, and we see then he, for the joy Saints of God, if there's one thing that will cause you to endure, keep the goal before you. Forget the things which are behind. Reach forth to the things which are before. And we press 
towards the mark of the prize of the whole high calling of God. It literally means to uh, Philippians 3.14, we can put it up there, the, the, to, to, ex, to the full extension. Did you ever see those races where those runners are just giving anything and everything they got across, stretching their themselves to the utmost, and it's, it's within, within just a, a millisecond of victory between the racers. I remember as we were in, in, in Elderick, Kenya, and you had the world-class runners they used to trace just a few miles outside of the town there. We actually rented a room for a, uh, Moses Kiptanu. He was a gold medalist. He was, I'd talk to him all the time. And I would watch these runners train, and I would watch what they would do there in, uh, in Eton, up in the highlands, and and I understood. I, I understood, too, why they trained there. It was so high up that, you know, they'd be used to running in that thin oxygen that when you come down, you can, to this day, I could go out that door right now and I could run 10 miles right now just from living in it. And I used to run in it. I could, I cheat you not, I could go out that door right now and run 10 miles. I run out of time. Finally, I got it, or the knees hurt, you know. But it's not that I'm winded, you know. Either the knees hurt, I got too many calls and texts are coming. I ain't got time for all this. I like to keep running, be, you know, super runner, but I ain't got time. But I would just see them as they would extend in those great races. And, 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 and what he's saying that I, uh, I, I press towards the mark. We need to just press into the kingdom and... And, and he said in the verse before, it was actually verse 13 when he said, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth. That's where he means stretching. Saints, are we stretching? Are we really pressing in? Does a little adversity come and we just give in and say, oh, pastor, sorry, blah, 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 or my brother, my sister, I'd like to help? Or You know, what, what are we really, are we really extending ourselves are are we willing to be in agony in prayer are are we really willing to agonize to stay faithful to the call and sometimes i get concerned because when i see many in the flock where we're just we're caving into the pressures and and i'm not here to condemn anyone god knows when you can't be here and there's no one here with the report card and attendance sheet. or We're talking about the Spirit, saints. Hear what I'm saying. When, when we could be here, or you could be there for your brother or sister, or you could make that sacrifice, and, and we're just not willing to, to press in. We're, we're just not willing to extend. We're not willing to agonize. Oh, my goodness, Jude chapter 1 and verse 4, that he, he, he thought at once he was, he was, there was a sense of urgency. Jude wrote that, uh, that I should write to you at once and, and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Because there's certain men crept in unawares before of old ordained to this condemnation that Jude 1 and verse 4, that turn 3, 4, and 5, turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. So many in the church today, they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. There's no fervor. There's no fervency. There, there, there's no death to self. There, there's, there's so few cross pairs. There's so little teachings on denying self and, and living the crucified life and, and testifying of the resurrection life that comes when we're dead to self. Hallelujah. And we look at it and he says, you've got to earnestly contend for the faith. Are you earnestly contending, saints? Earnestly contending. It's the same Greek word except there it's epi And whenever you see epi, it's just kind of a magnifying. It literally means upon, upon, upon. 
It's an intensifying. It's, a, it's an emphasis of a magnification of the word. And, and so when we're talking about this earnest contention, when we're, we're talking about this fighting, this, this struggle, this, this being engaged in spiritual war, this toil, this intensive toil and labor that through great difficulties and dangers and antagonism that we're, we're straining ourselves and with zeal, to obtain and so he says you're going to have to earnestly contend for the faith and so when I go back to, to Hebrews chapter 12 he says you know that you've you got to look at Jesus who for the joy there was something that was driving Jesus it behooved him to, to suffer these things it says that he might bring many sons to glory hallelujah he was seeing you. He was seeing me. He was seeing all of those that were on a road of damnation or under the judgment of sin to be saved. Saints, do you see what you're fighting for? You're fighting for your children. You're fighting for your brothers and sisters. We're not fighting for nickels and dimes. We're not in a crapshoot here. We're, we're, we're not fighting for a lottery. We're not fighting for, for some to win a new car. We're talking about eternal souls. We're talking about seeing our brothers and sisters make it into heaven. We're talking about our children. What am I living? You can't cheat your kids. They see what you are. You can try to act like you're a righteous authority, but they know they know if you're walking in the Holy Ghost. They know if you're really after God. They'll find you on your knees. They'll hear you crying out to God. They'll hear you boldly preaching in His name, or they'll hear you denying, compromising, bad-mouthing, double-talking, uh, smoothing over, justifying. They see it all. And they will not imbibe nearly as much as what you tell them or teach them to do is what you live. What you live. Hallelujah. I remember my granddad, he'd always tell me, I know you. I know, he was real good to my other brother. Like brother Mike, my brother Mike, he was good, man. He, me, he says, I know you're up to, I, he's always tell me, I know you like a book. You don't cheat me, you're up to no, I'd be looking at him as a young kid. So how do you know I'm up to no, you don't know that. You didn't see that. Every bit he was saying, man, I was stealing his beers and doing whatever I could. But he said, I know you like a book. <laughs> and I'd be looking at him like, how does he know? He doesn't know. You know? Maybe he does. How does he know? You know? <laughs> they will read you. And, and so what we're fighting for is the souls. And, and, and when we look at this and as we wind up, we then see that it's in Hebrews 12 that that he, he, for the joy that was set before me, endured this cross, despising the shame, and now he's rewarded, and you will sit on his throne with him if you overcome. Hallelujah. You look at the next verse, and, and he says, For consider him who endured such a contradiction of sinners, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. I mean, look at what the price he paid. How can I sit here and feel sorry for myself when I look at the weight and what the, the sacrifice he paid and, and how undeserving he was of it? And verse 4, for you have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Oh, my goodness, if we could just get hold of God, the martyrs that have gone, those that have shed their blood. How can I sit here and cry for these sufferings I'm going through when those paid such a greater price? And so I encourage us in 1 Corinthians 9, and as we go back there and we'll, we'll wind it up, but how Paul was saying that we, you know, if we're going to win that victor's prize, that we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to run to obtain. Every man, verse 25, is gonna, that strives for the mastery must be temperate in all things, self-controlled, disciplined. Now, we know the only way we can discipline our flesh is by the power of the Spirit of God. Amen? 
We don't have time tonight to develop that, but you can just write in your notes. I love a simple verse as Romans chapter 8 that in verse 13, if you live after the flesh, you'll die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live for as many as are led by the spirit of God. They are the huios, the mature sons of God. So we mortify the deeds of the body by being in the Holy Ghost, his word in you, fellowship with God, abiding in him, his word abiding in you. And and if we're going to win that victor's crown, we've got to be temperate. How temperate are you with the things of the world? You know, as I sat and shared yesterday that that lawyer, you know, we got done. It took us a while to get through a lot of papers. And he says, can you, I need you to, uh, to come with me to go to City Hall and these others to try to clear these, these debts. Can you come with me? And, and I had so much going on, I really didn't feel like going. But I knew this man wants me to go with me because he's wanting to hear more of the gospel. He ain't cheating me, you know. He knows. He heard enough about me in my life, and I had times to share some. And he wrote all over and here and there. We're in City Hall and Rathbill and all these places. And then he, even at the end, he says, well, you know, would you mind if I stopped and ordered a meal, you know? And before I got, I said, no, go ahead, you know? And then he said, he called me, how long will it be? Half an hour. I said, it's all right. Don't worry about it. I'm thinking, man, it's just more time to share Jesus with this guy. And and I've got a zillion things, a million text messages, two million phone calls, three million uh, of this and that. But I'm just, uh, I just feel the Holy Ghost is stay right where you are. Hallelujah. Just keep sharing the Lord with him. Here's a man who went to Bishop Turner, grew up not far blocks away from where I grew up, lived there his whole life, never went anywhere. Went through Canisius, Bishop Turner, all these colleges, lawyer, wealthy, driving his BMW, sitting in there, man, this is what this feels like, BMW, you know, sitting in there, but just sharing the Lord with them. And you could just see the emptiness in them, the emptiness of self-righteousness, the emptiness of all of this wealth and power. The, the, his own boss, I, I like how he does his business, no secretary, just does it himself, I'm free, no big payroll, and just living good, but empty in his soul. And when we see in what Paul was saying, we're, we're striving for that victor's crown. It's, it's how tempered are we the things of the world. We rode around a little bit down there, and he shows me this, and he shows me McCarthy's, and he shows me this other Italian bunch. He knows where they all are. I say, this man likes to eat, man. Like, you ever go here? Uh, no, but I've seen it. You know, I've rode by it a lot of times. Did you ever eat here? No, I've seen that. I know exactly where. Did you ever eat here? No, no, can't say I have. You know, <laughs> must be good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's good. Real tasty. Mmm, man. But I've got a meat. I'm thinking he knows nothing of. Hallelujah. And as we see this, Paul says, we've got to be temperate. And, and, and he says that if, you're, you, you, if we strive for that mastery, they're doing it to obtain a corrupt crown. When I was leaving them, I said, everything you got, you're going to leave it behind. You've got all of this stuff, and you've got a beautiful business. You've worked hard. You've lived a good life. But you know what? You're going to stand before God, and all your righteousness is this filthy rags. It's not enough to get rid of the guilt of your sin. He wanted to talk now about the anthropologists and the cavemen. And the, I went right back to the cross. Hallelujah. You know, we could talk about that a long time, but that ain't going to change. You're going to stand before God. Let's stay here. I believe as we close tonight and we think of that victor's crown, I run, not as one that's beating the air. Verse 27, but I keep under my body, or I, in other words, I bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Write in your notes, and Deacon Lorano will put it on the screen. One thing I can tell you about pressing in, and I just got to leave you with this last verse, 
As he said in verse 28, whom we preach, Colossians 1, 28, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom. We're warning every man that we may present every man perfect in, G in Christ Jesus, which is what I'm longing to see you finish the race, to see this flock finish the race, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. And all I wanted you to see, our striving is his power working in us. It's not hu some human wisdom. It's not some human ability. It's not some earthly uh, 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 self-induced motivation. It's really a yielding to the working of his power that's in you. That power of the Holy Ghost is in you tonight. And it's really a yielding and a surrendering. Uh, that's uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, and we can put it in the amplified version, and, and it'll be the last word that we read in verse 29 then. And, 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 and when you see it there, you can really understand what we're talking about, of that, that, that we're striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So our, our striving with all superhuman energy which he so mightily enkindles and works within. God, when you yield and you purpose, God, it's your way or no way. I'm walking in the straight and I'm doing your will. And when you yield and surrender, there will be supernatural energy to cause you to do things you never dreamed you could or would do. Hallelujah. I would have, if you would have told me what I would go through for 15 years in Africa when I was in, I would have croaked and died, man. I mean, if you would have showed me all that, this is what you're going to go through the next 15 years, you know. The other day I was walking in the cold wind blowing on me, and here it's like, how in the world did I end up back in Buffalo, New York, you know. <laughs> it's just like, am I really here? It's like, you are here, you know. <laughs> Right where you came from is a piece of clay. Hallelujah. But God, in his sovereign workings and in his infinite wisdom that has that perfect plan for each and every one of us is with his divine energy is empowering you supernaturally, energizing you to press into the kingdom. It's not based on your ability. It's his ability in you. Father, we thank you tonight for these promises of your word, Lord. And Father, it is those that will suffer with you that will reign with you. Lord, we can't dwell at ease, Lord. It, Lord, that we would rise up in this hour and hear the cheers of the lives, the inspiring testimonies of the great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us and say, God, we've we got to finish our course. We want to be able to say with Paul, the age, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. There's a crown of righteousness laid up for me, and not to me only, but unto all those also that love is appearing. Father, we grow weary. We get discouraged. We get tired. Sometimes we just want to lay down, Lord, and just, just forget about it all. But God, help us for the joy that's set before us, that victor's crown, to stand before you unashamed, to see the souls that will meet us at the gates of heaven, to thank us that we are obedient to your spirit and and that it was our obedience that brought them into the kingdom. As they'll shout, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. As we march into the gates of that eternal kingdom to receive that victor's crown and to sit on your throne, Lord, with you as overcomers. And God, we get so weary and nearsighted at times. We get so slothful and our walls get broken down and the weeds of the world grow up and the fruit withers and the foxes are spoiling the vine. And God help us to set those walls back up and to be diligent and weed the gardens of our hearts and to be found faithful stewards, Lord. 
God, we don't want to dwell at ease and sit on our comfortable couches in our warm little homes. While the house of God is hurting, lives are hurting. Children that need the word of God, that need to see saints that love the Lord, that are faithful and committed and diligent, earnestly contending for the faith. Father, help us not to be nearsighted. Help us to lay hold on eternal life, to fight, to agonizomai, fight the good fight of faith, to lay hold on eternal life. Father, we thank you today for speaking to us. Work it in us, Lord. We give you the praise and all of the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Glory to God. Well, if you believe that, say amen.